This is the decision point with Anand and Dury. Anand, it's been too long. It's been way too long. I was in Japan, as everybody knows at this point. You're a very busy man, but we decided to, the people have waited long enough. It's been what three months? God, <laughs> nice, too long, nice man. Summer vacation for us is you know January through April, I guess. If another person, you know, sets me down and says, "You know, my favorite show is The Decision Point. You guys need to do more episodes. You need to take your head out of your ass, Pod Father." Enough. We're here. Head extracted from asshole. Here we are with the man, <laughs> and and the beauty is, it's almost like we planned it. It's almost like I was like, you know what? It's just like Braveheart, right? Hold, hold, hold. No, no show, Anand. Hold, hold. All these moves, all these trades. Justin Fields, hold, hold, hold. Stefan Diggs, go charge! <laughs> uh, we had, it, landscape changed a lot since the last time we talked, Matt. We've had a Super Bowl champion crowned. We've had a bunch of moves made, some teams tearing down to the studs, quarterbacks moving all over the place. We've got wide receivers getting traded. We've got, you know, all these free agents getting signed. It's been a wild three months, but it's a lot more holistic of you that we have now than we would have had, you know, early to mid February, right after Super Bowl. So excited to get back into it. And obviously we've got a lot to, to, to discuss today. We have a lot more to discuss today than we did three days ago right and, and and don't forget don't forget drake london as a quarterback i mean we, there's just so much where do we start 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 we have to start in houston they've traded for stefan diggs it's just totally and completely on in houston it's exciting what a time to be alive what i love about the nfl is you can be wallowing and your team can be an embarrassment and Two years later, Super Bowl. Like, it, you know, let's ride. That That's the, the turnaround and the rebuild of possibilities. We, we saw it already with Detroit. Now we're seeing it in Houston. I think the next team after that, Chicago, is, is uh, you know, we'll see who they who they draft. We, we, we're pretty sure we know who it's going to be. We're pretty, pretty sure, but uh, not 100%. Maybe, maybe get into that for a minute uh, later on in the show. But for now, Diggs goes to Houston. Can you talk about why this trade happened? Well, I mean, so I tweeted out yesterday. This is the sixth highest dead cap in NFL history. Stephon Diggs, 31, almost $31.1 million in Buffalo that they're leaving behind. And, you know, just to remind everybody, dead cap is money that you've already assigned to a player that you just haven't allocated to the cap yet. So they're going to pay $31 million to the cap that they've already paid digs for him not to be there. That's a massive, massive amount of money to pay a player to not be there during what you believe is a championship window. So from the Bills side of things, they're trying to clean up the books in kind of the way the Chiefs did a couple years ago when, when they moved off of Tyree Kill. The difference being that was a little bit different a situation where Tyreek just wanted more money. They basically decided that we need to reset without digs. And Houston came in and said, well, we could probably use that guy. We're, we're a couple pieces away from really making a run here. After last year, we drafted the offensive rookie of the year in CJ Stroud and possibly had the best rookie season ever. The defensive rookie of the year in Will Anderson Jr., which, you know, very, very risky proposition to move up and do what they did. But oh. that also, that also, you know, if if you get a player of that caliber and he hits, you know, at some point you have to accept, you know, even if we think it's a draft capital overpay, the payer is the player. No one said, Anderson, hey, no one said, no one said you can't trade up. Okay, <laughs> I want to be very clear in, in, in terms of the, the archives of this show. Okay, we don't like trading up. If we are consulting with a team, we say do not trade up 99% of the time. Probabilistically, it's a very, very difficult road. But it is a road that you can travel. And you, if you weave that, what has to happen for it to be worth it is that you have to hit big on the guy you pick. 
And then your picks the following year have to be heavily discounted because your team improves so much from one year to the next. That's exactly what happened with Will Anderson and the Texans. That's what's needed. That's essentially what you saw them threading the needle with that trade up. That is the outcome that is necessary for a big trade up into the first round to work out, to be, you know, to net positive value for your franchise because it's possible doesn't mean it's a good idea but i'm glad that it worked out because now just like what the chiefs did with tyree kill was a model that the bills could follow They're like oh the chiefs got away with it they traded their alpha receiver and then went right back to the super bowl i'm sure we can do it too right so now everyone's like well i saw the uh i saw the the texans traded up and uh, that was that was it seemed like a great move for them. Like, well, we'll just do what the Texans are doing, right? Uh, probably should. If you're going to follow a rebuilding model, my suggestion is lean Detroit more than Houston, right? So Detroit did it the more conservative way, took a little bit longer, and it's worked out very well. They could face each other in the Super Bowl. Could be a Houston Detroit Super Bowl. We could be looking at the, 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 the two best rebuilds in recent memory, you know, microwaving you know, Super Bowl visits. If you want to follow the Texans path, that's a lower probability path. They took a huge swing from the heels and they knocked it out of the park. Congrats to them. The the biggest thing that I think is a parallel between the two, and we talk about this all the time. The two best units on those teams are their offensive lines. Their quarterbacks look better because they built those up. And it's not by accident. The other team that took a huge swing in round one last year and traded up is Carolina. That's the that's the perfect example of what happens when that trade up doesn't pay off. Now look at where they are in, in terms of what they have to get to to even be relatively competitive at that point in the NFC. So, I mean, it, it's... It's not a one size fits all. Not every trade up is the worst thing ever. It's just the the range of outcomes for trading up is relatively slim in terms of it working out. This one absolutely did. There's no no way to discount it. When Atlanta traded up for Julio Jones, that worked out, even though they gave up a, a ridiculous amount of assets to do it. But that's the kind of outcome that's necessary to take that huge swing and move up that far. But when you get a cornerstone piece the year before in Derek Stingley Jr. You know, you have a lockdown corner. Then you get an edge rusher and you get a quarterback. The offensive line was already relatively built. They paid Dalton Schultz. You hit on Tank Dell last year. Nico Collins has his breakout because he finally gets a quarterback. And then you look all around at the pieces that they've brought in. I'm not the Joe, biggest Joe Mixon guy. But he's been relatively productive. If not, it's not spectacular. But he's been productive when he's when he's out there. So when you look at what Houston really needs, a lot of it is defense, and it's you know it's cornerback, it's safety, it's edge rusher, it's interior defensive lineman, and these are all the things that their head coach specialized in helping them develop and draft at his last stop. And so now you're looking at this Houston Texans team who a year ago we we sat here and were worried that they might be the ones that end up with Bryce Young and maybe in the situation that you don't want to be in where you're taking the guy that you may not have wanted. And there are multiple reports that they wanted Bryce or they wanted CJ. We'll never know. Nobody's ever going to come out and tell you 100% what, what they were going to do. But they, one way or another, lucked into CJ – forcefully traded up got will anderson and now you're looking at this team as one of those rosters where it's really difficult to see a path where they're not among the best teams in their conference which is crazy to say given that they're in a much tougher conference than the lions are if you're looking at these two rebuilds the toughest part of rebuilding in the afc is it you you don't want to be pittsburgh you don't want to be Average. If you're average, you're not going to get a good enough player to take you over the top like a C.J. Stroud is capable of taking Houston. And so one of the things that I think we, we've we discussed on this show and one of the reasons we liked Houston's over last year was 
even if CJ didn't have the year that he had, the roster is just better than people think it is. And that offensive line is going to carry them to some wins and games that they probably shouldn't win. You look at how teams are rebuilding now, as opposed to how they rebuilt before. It's starting to look like teams are understanding, all right, you invest in offensive linemen. Even, even when you have offensive linemen, you invest in depth in the O-line because dudes are going to get hurt. Green Bay's done it a spectacular job of this forever. You draft offensive linemen over and over and over again, and that way you're never thin there. And Houston's done a fantastic job of doing the same thing. The pick that never gets talked about in last year's draft when, when we were there in KC, nobody talks about the round two pick where they drafted the center, Juice Scruggs, out of Penn State. He was really good. Oh, we talked about it. I mean, we talked about it, but I'm saying it wasn't – that's not the pick that was widely lauded. It was the top two and then Tank Dell. Uh, they're, the way that they drafted last year has set them up for success in a way that you can only hope a single draft class can set you up for in the future. And so all these people that are, you know, it's been out there, people have been talking about, you know, oh, like I would follow Houston's path to a rebuild. I don't think that that's realistic. I don't think you're going to get – the head coach and coordinator hires as home runs. I don't think you're going to get the best rookie quarterback maybe ever. I don't think you're going to get a potential future all pro edge rusher, a very good wide receiver and a starting center in the same draft. That's just, <laughs> that does not happen very often. You know who we loved in the second round last year? These are three of the, the three, the four, I would say the four of the, my favorite picks in the second round last year, Steve Avila, Okay. Remember Steve Avila? Big dog. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cody Motch. Dog. Dirty dog. Dirty dog. Cody Motch, right? And John Michael Schmitz. Right? Angry football players. Like uh, Wisconsin. Right? Wisconsin interior. Juice Scruggs. Right? Those. <laughs> that is essentially... All of the interior offensive line, there's nothing I like better in the second round than an, an, a high-quality interior offensive lineman. That's where you get them. That's where you go shopping. So when you allocate certain spots, slots in the draft for certain positions, it's hard to beat how Houston pulled this off, right? Because that's the thing. When you look at how they... They segmented and then sequenced their draft picks. They said, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna start with the foundation, which we already had. We already had we already had the foundation started, right? With the Laramie Tunsil trade. That's that's actually a, 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 an O'Brien special, right? That was an o, that was the massive overpay. They're like, we don't care if it was an overpay or not. We're we, we, that's the that's the one guy we're gonna build around. So the reason we we're taking the over." The two names we kept talking about last year, the reason for the over, was Howard and Tunsil. Tunsil and Howard. That's your base. That's where you're going to build from. And then you're going to use a first rounder on an elite edge rusher or a three technique even better, right? It's not just an edge rusher. You want a three technique. You want a, a, a proper two-way defensive end. That is the best possible pick. Uh, on the defensive side of the football. That's the guy that's rare that you cannot find in free agency. Okay. Is 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 he, is it easy to find an elite cornerback in free agency? Absolutely not. Right? But they're available. Usually have to draft them in the first round. So that's what they did with Stingley, right? So they're picking all the right positions when they're shopping for you know, uh defense. They're saying, "Okay, we're going three technique and cornerback in the first round only. We're shopping in the first round for offense, quarterback, tackle. That's the list. The thing that, that Houston did, and this is not talked about enough, is they didn't make the, the critical mistake of wasting picks. If you're going to do this, if you're going to thread this needle, you better not waste any picks. You better not burn picks on middle linebackers. You better not burn picks on strong safety. You better not burn picks on interior defense, on run stuffers, right? On wide receivers even, running backs, right? You can't. They were like, we're going to sign 
Devin Singletary off the scrap heap and roll with a fourth rounder and Damian Pierce in the backfield, and then we're good. We're good. Like that that was just such a breath of fresh air. Like, yes, this is how you build. I didn't like the trade up, but it worked out. If you're gonna pick all the right positions in the right rounds and the right slots, then you're further increasing your probability of this rebuild working out. And then they're doing the thing that you're begging every franchise to do, which is when you know you're ready to win, go win. Now it's time to go acquire veteran receivers. Receivers are so hard to hit on. Just look at the hit rates and the breakout finder and the percentage chance of a hit. It's much easier to, to, to predict a hit at running back than it is wide receiver. So why even bother? Why bother investing more than a third rounder in the wide receiver position? You either try to hit in the third round or not, and you can walk away very easily. Nico Collins doesn't hit. You walk away. Easy. No problem. Right? And then you go into free agency to get your alpha receiver. Like Miami did. Like uh, Buffalo did before. And now Houston's doing the same thing. We go into free agency and we take a, a, you know, a, a bargain bin running back instead of burning a draft pick on that guy. And they're going to you know, go to free agency and get your strong safety. Go into free agency and get your middle linebacker. If you build that way, I will love you. I will love you. I mean, the days of Bill, Bill O'Brien, we were making fun of this franchise, are so long gone. And now I'm just like tingling. I, I, I didn't you know, come into this loving Detroit. I don't have any loyalties to Detroit. But how they built that franchise, I respected the hell out of it. So that's what I love. I love Howie Roseman, how he's doing things in Philadelphia. So when I see that, I become, fa I'm not a fair weather fan. I'm a fan of front office execution. So now on Sundays, I'm rooting for Houston. I'm rooting for Detroit. I'm rooting for Philadelphia. And that rooting interest is coming from a place of, I respect the hell out of their process. I'm, one of the things that doesn't get talked about nearly enough, and it's because we've all kind of moved on from it, is they had their franchise quarterback in Watson. They did it. You know, they had already kind of kind of figured out the process. And even with Watson, they were a 4-12 and team. I think he led the league in passing yards that year. Three years later, roster mostly totally flipped. J.J. Watt gone. DeAndre Hopkins gone. Deshaun Watson gone. All of these players that we grew, you know, we grew accustomed to seeing as Houston Texans, all of them are gone. And they rebuilt that thing in three years, much the same way that Philly did. When they had to move off of Wentz, they had, draft, they had already drafted Jalen Hurts. So even though the timelines are a little bit different, the process was rather similar. We're going to take a quarterback before we know we have to take a quarterback, right? They tried the Davis Mills experiment. They drafted him in the third round. It didn't work out. And so they decided, okay, we have something in our O-line here. We have something in this Nico Collins kid. Let's get him a quarterback and see what he can do. And they were fortunate enough that they didn't, that the best rookie quarterback ever fell into their lap. They had the foresight to trade up and say, hey, Will Anderson Jr. is not just a good edge rusher. He's a potential franchise cornerstone edge rusher that we can rely on for years and years and years, a la a Miles Garrett or a TJ Watt. Then they went down and took a center. Then they went down and took the receiver that their quarterback asked them to take. All of them work out. And suddenly we're sitting here and the Houston Texans look like one of, if not the premier threat to Kansas City in the AFC right now. I, I mean, if you're looking at it, that the top of the list right now is Cincinnati and Baltimore, Houston, and then, you know, it's everybody else after KC. Because Buffalo right now has to figure out what that receiver room is going to look like. And, you know, I think Josh Allen is talented enough to figure out a lot of things. But once you get to December and January and you need a guy to go get you eight catches for 120 yards, I just don't know that they have that on their roster right now. And I don't know that they will have that on their roster after they draft this year. But the way that Houston has gone about this, they can move those three around all over the place. Stefan played in the slot more than he had his entire career last year. That I think it was like almost 37%, something like that. Um, and then you look at what Tank Dell does, and you look at what Nico Collins does. 
you can move digs all over the place. You can move Tank Dell in and out. Just leave Nico as your ex. You have Dalton Schultz there. Joe Mixon at times has shown he can be a capable pass catcher. Sure. And if you want to draft a pass catching running back, you know, fifth, sixth round of this draft, you're again in a great spot. And going back to the thing that we were talking about with interior alignment, there's just a name that you need to know if you're not deep in the draft weeds like we are. And there's been potential round one talk on him, but I think it's probably more likely that he's later, later half day one, early day two. Jackson Powers Johnson, the center from Oregon. Is yeah, I mean, he went down to the senior bowl and ragdolled people. And that's the kind of player that you sit there at the top of the second round. And if you see him on your draft board, you take him. Need need aside, that's the kind of player that that will play eight to ten years in the NFL at a very high level. And that's the kind of guy that could potentially be a future all pro interior O lineman. And those guys are very hard to find wow. at that level. If you a center, draft. especially, is harder to find than a guard. If they took him at pick 23, I wouldn't blink. I would love it. And, you know, there, there's so many things that, that that you're capable of doing if you've built out your roster the way that the Texans have. They can go do whatever they want in this draft. And, and it's not going to be a, you know, a referendum on anything that they've built only because they've gotten all the key spots right already. Yeah. You need a second corner. You need a safety. You need an interior defensive lineman. That That's basically rounding out the roster. That's it. That's what I'm saying. And you need a center. It, get a center. That's the quarterback of the offensive line. You need that guy. Use a first-round pick on him all, all day. Please, by all means. It's you're, you're already a playoff team. Just don't screw it up. right? Yeah. Don't do what Detroit did and you know whiff on Jamison Williams, field stretcher in the first round, Eh, mistake right don't do that running back in in the mid first round eh, mistake middle linebacker in the first round eh, mistake can Detroit come back from that can they burn like you know multiple picks on fire and still you know go to the Super Bowl we'll see at this point the Texans are executing their rebuild given the mistakes that Detroit has made recently in the first round Texans are executing their rebuild better than Detroit is. This is going to be a big moment for the Texans. This is a big moment. There's a lot riding on that pick. Not even their pick. That's the Browns pick. That's from Deshaun Watson. Right? Yeah. That move is, is paying so many dividends because it led to C.J. Stroud. It, it, it got that whole distraction away from their team. It got it netted them first-round picks. Now the Browns don't have their first-round pick. It's beautiful. I mean, and what, they, a, what a what a what, what, what a beautiful thing to to be able to go get your franchise center, and then literally every box is checked, and it, you can you can do whatever you want. You can just continue to add depth in these key critical places, like we talked about depth in the interior offensive line, depth in the interior defensive line. These positions that are, are ravaged by injuries year in year out. You want to maximize your depth in those areas. So, I mean, Houston is going to be. One of the favorites to win the Super Bowl. Are you looking at the the, the have you looked at the futures uh, on not the the odds to win the Super Bowl yet? I have not. Where where is Houston in there? It, they've got to be close to the top, if not the top. Because I mean, I think when you look at when you look at what they've done relative to other teams around them in the past year, just in the past three hundred sixty five calendar days, Houston may have improved more than any team in the league. And they are the one, two, three, four, five, seventh best odds to win the Super Bowl. Surprisingly, still behind Buffalo, behind Detroit, behind Dallas. But that's going to change. Yeah, that's uh, going to change. Fifteen to one. They, need to, they, the they need to be ten to one. They need to be ten to one. They need. I, I think they should slot in as the fourth favorite behind the Chiefs and Ravens. That's where they should slot in. Ten to one. That's that's. That's that's the odds. That's the odds of Texans win the Super Bowl. It's ten to one. It's a hell of a lot better than the Bengals. Hell of a lot better than the Cowboys and the Lions. Better than the Bills. Do you remember how we were talking about last year? How even though it doesn't happen that often, betting quarterback to win regular season MVP versus team futures to win the Super Bowl are kind of hand in hand markets. CJ Stroud's ten to one to win league MVP. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. There it is.
Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm very excited for Houston. Bravo. Tip of the cap. You know, if, if they, if they, if they don't go center there, what if, what if they trade down and they bank more picks? What if they get someone's first rounder in 2025? If they do some of those things, I am going to be aroused. <laughs> if they do some of those things, like um, you know, if we're at the draft house and I'm on the couch or something, and I get to see where the camera angle is, I just got to make sure that you know it's appropriate, right? For, it, it, you know, it's not it's not too embarrassing for everybody involved. If when these picks come in, I'm gonna be, you know, I'm gonna, I I could be very I I can see myself getting very 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 excited. We will pour up shots when the uh, when the Texans trade down. I don't know if they'll let me do that in the draft room, but <laughs> but it, it, <laughs> they're the going to have so sure. much fun. They're going to have so much fun because you're absolutely right. They're going to post up Nico Collins on the left side at X. They're going to try to get Nico Collins to try to get the opposing defense to match their alpha up against Nico, and then they're going to be moving Dell and Diggs all around. You know, so what I can see is a bunch of bunch formations where you have Schultz, Diggs. And Dell on the right side, and then you have Diggs and Dell flip flopping between flanker and slot, and playing off each other. A lot of the, a lot of the running the pick play uh, between those guys, and then that's that's impossible. That's a defensive impossibility. If if Diggs and and Dell are going to run the pick play, it's and, and and your alpha's over there like occupied by Nico Collins. I mean, what what are you going to do? Like what? What? What are the Colts gonna do? <laughs> oh, right? Man. What? What are some of these these teams in the AFC South? It's such a bad matchup, right? It's such a bad matchup where these you have some of the worst secondaries in the league in the AFC South. It's just amazing. It, it's amazing. So with Buffalo, what does this tell you? Like, what are they up to? I think this is very reminiscent of what. Casey did when Tyreek moved on to Miami, where you're in that second phase window. The early window of drafting a franchise quarterback is figuring out if he's the guy. And by the guy, I don't just mean, can he be a good quarterback? I mean, can he be the catalyst and the reason that you go to a Super Bowl? Do you have an elite, elite quarterback? The Bengals found that out about Joe Burrow very early on in year two. And then they poured every resource available in to go all in and have been since. Buffalo found that out in year three with Allen. And then they got him digs. And then they pushed in all in over and over and over again. Von Miller is a great example there. They they may they had a few free agent signings. They drafted guys that they thought could help immediately. And it's just at some point you have to accept that you can't follow the Saints blueprint with Drew Brees forever because he had an expiration date. He was going to retire and they were going to have to reset and redo everything. The toughest part is moving on a year early instead of a year late. Belichick is notoriously famous for doing this, but of the guys that are still in the league now, Kansas City and Brett Veach has done a masterful job of saying, look, we're going to lose him anyway. We're just going to let him go. And, and they did it with multiple guys over the years. And it's basically just a, we trust our scouting department. We trust our draft team. We trust our general manager to replenish that talent so that we can keep winning with a quarterback that's making $50 million a year, as Josh Allen is, as Joe Burrow is about to be, as Mahomes is. All of these guys that are making ridiculous money, Herbert's about to be there, Jalen Hurts, Lamar Jackson. All of these guys are going to learn that there is a life cycle and their GMs probably if smart enough already know this. There's a life cycle at quarterback where you enter that second and third phase. That's no longer, we're trying to push all in while you're cheap. There's a little bit of a window when they're expensive that you can kind of go all in and push money into a couple of years. That's what they did with Diggs here. And then you've got to kind of come back and reset and say, okay, this is about the future. If Buffalo tried to push all in for 2024, it just wouldn't make sense. They can reset for a year, still be a pretty good team, figure out what pieces they can and can't afford to lose, draft a bunch of young guys, see what they've got, and fast forward into next year. So what Green Bay did last year in terms of drafting all of these wide receivers two years ago, then figuring out what Jordan Love is or isn't, right? 
they don't they know what Josh Allen is. So that's not the part of the equation that we're worried about. They need to draft a couple of young receivers this year and figure out what they are and replenish some stuff on defense. And hopefully, if they have a very successful draft class, then 2025 and beyond, that window is wide open for Josh Allen again because he's the only the only quarterback that you would definitely rather have than Josh Allen is Mahomes. There's that the only one. And so if you're talking about building block pieces, there is one better building block than Josh Allen in this league right now, for sure. And so, I mean, Buffalo's going to be fine. They're not going to fall off a cliff. They're not going to be some eight-win team. Yes, the top end, the ceiling has been lowered quite a bit by Diggs leaving because you do need a number one receiver at times. And, you know, unless Dalton Kincaid becomes Travis Kelsey, which we can hope, <laughs> but uh, unless he becomes the Travis Kelsey type weapon, it's really tough to say, hey, like, let's just copy the Chiefs blueprint of having a rookie wide receiver one and a bunch of pieces and a Hall of Fame tight end and go win a Super Bowl because that defense was nuts. We have breaking news. The Houston Texans have just traded their first round pick to the Minnesota Vikings for the Minnesota Vikings second round pick this year and their second round pick next year. And there's some other like late round picks involved. They've already done it. They already did the thing. They already did the thing. This is the beauty. This is the beauty of me going away. Me going to Japan. I didn't know this trade happened while I was in Japan. Okay, it didn't just happen. It happened while I was in Japan. But it's news to me. It's breaking news to me. That's the beauty of it. That you, you you see what just happened? That I was like, well, I would love for them to draft, you know, a center there or, you know, one of these. Pay but, you know, the, the real move would be to trade down, maybe acquire another second round pick. But, I mean, that's just wishful. Wait, that actually happened. No, that actually happened. What a fun space-time continuum event we just had where they already did the thing that we thought was best-case scenario for them to do. And with the Minnesota pick, pick 42, whatever it is, they'll be able to get potentially you know, one of, if not the best, center on the board if that's mm -hmm. the direction they go. So the guy that you wanted them to pick... That's why you laid that out the way you did. You're like, you know, early in the second round, first half of the second round, this guy could easily be there. That's the guy to circle for the for the Houston Texans. And uh, if that happens, if they do, if they do make that exact pick, I will be so happy. I will be. <laughs> I, will, I will be. I will be thrilled. And yeah, it, <sighs> Buffalo's window is now. And so it, to, to have to, to take the pain for a year, a pain year, an evaluation year, it's just like a pause. It's like we're going to pause. We know we can't win this year. We're going to see what we have. We're going to have a big assessment year. And then we're going to go right back over the top in 2025 and, and make a push. I like it. I mean, if there's anyone that should be trading down in the draft, it's, it's the Buffalo Bills. That's what they should be doing. And we've seen a bunch of stuff floated around about like how they could get into the top five or six for a Malik Neighbors or a Roma Dunze. It's floating all over Twitter right now. That's oh God. not – I don't think that's realistic. Um, the, the assets that they would have to give up in order to get there are so, so, so crazy. And you would have to find a team that's willing to move all the way down to the late 20s. Uh, that's that's a tall order. That's a really tall order. Um and I just, it's not I worth think, it. Don't do it. I, it's I think not the even way worth the conversation. It's not even worth the phone call. You should be if someone calls you and is like, "Hey, uh, you know, we're 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 picking it at six, and we you know we wanted to kind of see what your uh, appetite is," and then you'd be like, "Yeah, yeah, my appetite's pretty. Yeah, I like that's a great pick. I mean, that's going to be a you know talk to the Giants. It's going to be you know you guys have a lot of needs." I understand why you might want to trade down. You're 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 several players away. Makes sense. Let's talk. And then you talk and talk and talk. And the next thing you know, you're actually trading the Giants your pick and getting more Giants picks in the future. <laughs> like that would be the way to handle it. Be like, well, uh, yeah, your pick looks good, but also don't forget, like 
we you know I we have some good picks here too. You know, we, we but where where is Buffalo? Buffalo's picking at pick twenty eight. Was there a mm-hmm. trade while I was gone that happened to that pick, or is that real? I think they're still at twenty eight. Okay, I think they're so, still twenty. That's like, hey, you should really, you should definitely get into the first round. Definitely, you should. You need to have two first round picks. You should, you should trade for ours. I mean, especially when you look at you know how people are valuing quarterback this year. If somebody decides to fall to the back half of the first round and is waiting there at twenty eight, and somebody wants that fifth year option on a QB, whether that's a you know Michael Penix, if he's still there, or if Bo Nix falls beyond twelve to Denver where he's been mocked by basically everybody on the planet. Um, you know, I mean, we saw it last year. We literally watched it last year with Will Levis. Everybody in, is, you know, Will Levis is a top five. Will Levis might be top 10. He doesn't even go in the first round. So, no, I know. you know, well, the, 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 the worst one ever, the, the, the face plant of all time for the entire draft Nick community, because I don't think there was anyone, there wasn't a single person that had, Malik Willis falling as far as he did, like round three. <laughs> yeah, Malik, the Malik Willis fall what, that 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 was funny. That was yeah. just that was uh, the it was just uh, precipitous. It's right? a great so reminder was, not to take ourselves too seriously, too. Right? Yeah. Remember, you're, you're all fallible there, and like we're fallible. Like I didn't think Josh Allen was going to be a hit, but getting Stephon Diggs that really helps. So to get Stephon Diggs, if you're C.J. Stroud and you've already hit, man, that's just, woo, rich getting richer there. But it is interesting when you, you bring up the Packers, the way that they built around Jordan Love slowly, the way they brought in young receivers. Jordan Love is very similar to Josh Allen. They played in the same conference. It was Wyoming and Utah State, respectively. They came into the league as inefficient passers, developmental. They threw Josh Allen out there right away. They decided to protect Jordan Love behind Aaron Rodgers at first. But these are erratic passers. These are not, you know, super precise throwers of footballs, right? Their ball placement is bottom half of the league. They just have the arm strength to get it into windows that others can't even access, Right. And with Josh Allen, there's the extreme strength and mobility, which makes him elite with Jordan Love. He's essentially, you know, a lesser Josh Allen in every way, smaller, not quite the arm strength, not quite this, not quite that. But if I told you that you could have a discount Josh Allen, you would sign up for that every day if you're looking for a franchise quarterback. So that's that's now what Jordan Love has become. I was much faster to come to terms with the fact that Jordan Love is here to stay and he's a good player after living through the Josh Allen ascendance. Yeah, it's it's tough. Um, quarterback is a ridiculously tough evaluation, and the reason is because they're, what they do is impacted by everyone around them. Isolating their performance solely and watching how it translates to the next level is super tough. And it, it's the reason that there are you know, people get bored. We we talk about this every single year, this this time of year. People are bored of the top of the board. They want someone new to be QB1 every year. It's It's been Caleb Williams. It will be Caleb Williams. We all know it's Caleb Williams. But there are going to be people. Are you sure for- it's going to be Caleb? Caleb Williams apparently doesn't want to go to Chicago. It'll be Caleb Williams. I, you're, you're confident? Very. There's that I wouldn't even if I'm a sports book I wouldn't even offer it at this point there's just there's no reason to they're going to take Caleb Williams they moved off of fields they bare, all but handed him the key card to Hallis Hall at this point um but you know obviously but why why is it coming out he doesn't want to go there I think that was a lot of you know foreshadowing while Justin was still on the team I think there was a lot of you know behind the scenes stuff of the bears trying to figure out what they could get for Justin, what they could get for the number one overall pick. Because again, it's a marketplace. You should always be willing to, to listen to offers for whatever your assets oh, are. Wait, you think that that was somehow leaked because they wanted leverage in negotiations with teams for Justin Fields. They're like, Hey, we might actually hold on to Justin Fields. We may not get Caleb Williams. Yeah, I mean, that's a, smart front offices are always keeping you guessing on what they're actually trying to do. 
you have no idea. And and I think that's one of the things that Ryan Poles has learned in this couple of years as Bears GM is you don't want to tell people what you're doing. You don't want to tell people what you're doing. You don't want anyone to have an idea of what you're actually going to do until you've made the full decision to do it. And I think the fact that Justin is no longer a bear and is now a Pittsburgh Steeler and the fact that they've basically all but told everyone else, hey, uh, we're meeting with Caleb and we're meeting with Caleb and we're meeting with Caleb. It, it, it seems to be a done deal. He has basically everything that you could look for in, you know, a, an arm talent in terms of mobility can throw from every angle on platform, off platform. And the bears yeah. can offer him everything. Yeah. The bears can They're- offer him literally everything you want. Offensive line. That's where we're making all our investments last year. First round, right? We're going to keep going back to offensive line. We added DJ Moore. We're going to keep adding players. We had it. Yeah. I don't know. Keenan Allen, like we're pretty good. The, the, the best, re- the best possession receiver in the league. So I, I mean, uh, what else can we do for you, Caleb? Anything else? Anything? I mean, what else? Right? We're 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 rebuilding the right way. So it's also one of the original franchises. It's also like one of the best sports cities ever. In the it's like since like Rome and the Colosseum, like literally they built Soldier Field to look like the Colosseum. Right. I mean, yeah. how could you not? What 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 am I missing? Like, how would you Chicago? Like if it was another, if it was Jacksonville, if it was Tennessee, right, if it was a smaller market, then you could understand the. Hey, man, you know, my marketing team and my PR people like they're in my ear about maximizing my worth. Well, Chicago was one of the spots that you would circle to do that. Thank you very yeah. much. I mean, do you do anyone remember the 85 Bears? They had a whole music video. Yeah. I mean, they monetized pretty well, right? I mean, how many refrigerators did uh, William Perry sell? <laughs> if if Caleb Williams is the first true Chicago franchise QB since Sid Luckman, they will put a statue of him outside of Soldier Field. I mean, it's... They've been so, and it sucks because the fans here are awesome. All they want is a winner. They don't care how it looks. They don't care what it what it takes. They supported the hell out of that Mitchell Trubisky team that Matt Nagy had oh. twelve and four with smoke and mirrors. And you know, people are still talking here about how awesome that team was and what a great run that was and how excited they were to finally have the guy. And then for that to fall apart and then for Justin to never quite find his footing here, whether because of injury or whether, you know, his sack rate was too high, whatever the case may be, it just didn't work out here. And they were so excited when they drafted him. They speak fondly of Jay Cutler years. They're just so depraved here of, of a franchise quarterback. Like the the thing that's, that's staggering to me that I can't, I, every time I read it, I can't believe it. The Chicago Bears have never had a 4,000-yard passer, ever. Mm. Not one. Zero. Not even Cutler? Ever. Hmm. That's a great stat. Between the Bears and the Jets, there's one 4,000-yard passer ever. Do you know who it is? Ken O'Brien. Joe Namath. Oh, good for Joe. Good for Broadway Joe. I like my Ken O'Brien guess. (laughs) I'd I'd go to war with that Ken O'Brien guess. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, this is a, a, a thin thread, but follow me for a moment. There is something that is never discussed about football cities. And I, I just want to put it out there right now, because why not? Because it's April, and this is what we talk about. We talk about franchises. We talk about things beyond fantasy football. One thing I love about Chicago is the fact that the stadium is downtown. Okay? You go and park a stadium out in the goddamn Meadowlands, <laughs> right? Or, you know, FedEx Field is out in Landover. To get to those places is such a pain in the ass. Anyone that's ever been to a Ravens game where it's downtown, where you're in the shadows of the, the skyscrapers, where you go to to Pittsburgh and there's all the buildings, there's all the bars, there's all the restaurants, and then there's the baseball field 
and there's the football stadium next to each other in the downtown epicenter. That's what it's all about. That's what you want. That whenever you are, if you're going to a city where they're parking the stadium out in the suburbs, that to me is is just like with Miami, they put the Heat Stadium right downtown. Oh yeah, right, right on the water. Like if you're that that you have to, I bet that was one of the reasons why LeBron decided to go down there. He was <laughs> like, this is a pretty sweet setup for the stadium. You know, this is a pretty great way to go to work every day. So. You know, to anyone that's a city planner or a stadium planner, maybe listening to this show, for the love of God, please do not get talked into putting the stadium on the outskirts of the city next to the fucking airport. I hate that so much. Get these things downtown. You go to a bar and then you walk across the street and you go watch the game. That's how you do it. That's the move. That's just another one of many reasons to love Chicago. And Caleb Williams is going to be a bear. It's just very exciting. One piece that we should talk about is in, in, a, in a possibility for the Bills to backfill Stephon Diggs is this T. Higgins contract. Okay, so T. Higgins signs a one-year deal, right? Yeah, basically franchise tag functionally. Yeah, it was essentially the franchise tag, right? So... How how does what what is the dynamic here, right? To, to walk through the choice to not sign him to a longer term extension. What is he thinking? What is the team thinking? What's the probability of him being traded but before the season starts? What what do you think? So this goes back to an ages old story about the Bengals and how they spend money. They are among the teams in the league. This is not to be mean in any way. Relatively speaking, they're cash poor. Their owners are not multi-billionaires that are, you know, that have businesses and businesses and businesses and can basically draw from unlimited wealth. The Bengals are their business. And it's shout out Tyler. <laughs> Minnesota's a great time. Uh, I forgot it. Minnesota but, has downtown stadiums, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one, one of the things that they've historically been hesitant to do is guarantee money past year one. We talked on the show about how you have to put guaranteed money at signing an escrow. And the, the Bengals basically didn't have a stadium sponsor for years. You know, it was just Paul Brown stadium. And obviously they put it in pay core. They signed a bunch of things, you know, they signed a bunch of deals to, to, put together a bunch of advertising money because they knew eventually you're going to have to put a bunch of money in escrow for burrow. You're probably gonna have to put a bunch of money in escrow for Jamar chase. And there really isn't a composite roster that we can talk about that has two wide receivers being paid that kind of money and a quarterback being paid that kind of money. Unless you go all the way back to the Colts with Marvin Harrison and Reggie Wayne with Peyton Manning. And that's really the only roster that that ever had guys paid like that and I mean, the this reason is what I, this is this kills me on and because we talked about this we predicted that t higgins was not going to be able to sign a long-term extension and that that his the, the time was ticking on the t higgins contract for all these reasons the fact that it's the bengals the fact that it's t higgins and it's he's not worth an alpha receiver contract, but you know that these fake alphas, they get these contracts. You mm -hmm. year in year, you can set your watch by it. So it, it, it all lined up perfectly, and yet all the commentary was, oh, T. Higgins is going to be a, a bangle. T. Higgins isn't going anywhere. T. Higgins isn't going anywhere. And it's like, really? Really? You, you, you think, bro, wh why? Why would, I, I, you know, uh, the rap sheet reported he's going he's gonna to stay with the Bengals. Like, get, uh, no, we're reporting historically it's unprecedented and it doesn't make any sense yeah. we're reporting it on the decision point it's it's almost impossible to build a roster that way i mean you can get away with it for a year or two but then you get into really deep serious trouble in terms of how your cash flows work what your salary cap allocation looks like i mean you're talking about basically hitting on draft pick after draft pick after draft pick just to stay you know to, to tread water because you want to pay two receivers and and a, a mistake a lot of teams make that i hope cincinnati doesn't fall into is well we had this big rangy basketball 
player, plays above the rim-esque wide receiver in T. Higgins. So we have to replace him if we decide to let him go with another big, rangy, tall, above the rim wide receiver just because that archetype has worked with Burrow and Chase before. If you're going to draft wide receiver high, which they probably are, I would assume in round two this year, take the best player. Don't try to fill the role that was lost. Take the best player. Because if you keep trying to chase this T. Higgins archetype, you're going to end up with players that are not T. Higgins. And you didn't want to pay T. Higgins T. Higgins money, so you're certainly not going to want to pay diet T. Higgins T. Higgins money when the right. time comes four years down the road. Just take the best receivers available and figure it out from there. And I think that their front office has done a great job of backfilling roles as they lose players. But I really truly think that they thought last year was a year that that they could get it done. And Burrow getting hurt obviously changes the way that we retroactively look at that, even though I think it made sense for them to keep T. Higgins last year and chop him this offseason as basically a hey, even if you don't want to pay him, if you're as you know, if you're a contender in let's say the NFC, here's a one year rental for you. Um it's just I to me, I find it difficult to believe that Cincinnati is going to trade him to another AFC contender and basically give Buffalo a piece that they desperately need. I just, I, it's tough to see that happening unless they're willing to overpay in a big way. Bengals fifteen to one, fourteen to one, thirteen to one. They are the eighth favorites to win the Super Bowl. There's, Do you think they're a Super Bowl contender this year? I think they're a definite contender because I think it's Kansas City and then it's a group of teams. We think Houston's in that. I think Cincinnati's in that. I think Baltimore's in that. Um, if if Cleveland gets out of Watson what they think they may get out of Watson, Cleveland may join that discussion. Man, that's a tough division to be in. Um, but you know, then you've got this massive teams right behind them. Like There are those five or six. You can add Buffalo to that if you want. And then there's this 7 through 12 log jam of Chargers, Broncos, Jaguars, Colts potentially. You know, all of these teams. Packers. Where... <laughs> That's the NFC. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I was thinking about something else. Uh, and you get to this log jam of teams that you, you hope because one of them is eventually going to take the jump and join that group. And one of that group of six at the top is either going to suffer injury or for another reason, fall down the ranks. So that's, that's why the AFC to me is so compelling is because you have legitimate quarterbacks at, like everywhere. I mean, f whatever you think of Tua, he's remarkably productive and we haven't mentioned the dolphins yet. So like th there's, there's a lot going on here. You have the Jets going all in with Aaron Rodgers. Like this is not this is not your mom and dad's AFC where there are three quarterbacks at the top and no one else. This is depth at quarterback that I don't think we've ever seen in a conference and you're assuming that the Raiders are going to draft somebody, you're assuming that the Broncos are going to draft somebody, you know, you're assuming that New England's going to draft somebody. We could be talking about the best quarterback conference ever. And I don't think that's hyperbole at all. No, no, it's not. And uh, if you did want to bet on Jacksonville, I like those Jacksonville odds the best. When you're looking at all the the uh, all the you know the odds and uh, Bet MGM fifty to one, fifty to one on Bet MGM, your old stomping grounds. Bet MGM use promo code Underworld Underworld on Bet MGM to maximize your bonus bets. So if you don't have Bet MGM yet, you can download the app. Use promo code Underworld when you're setting up. Maximize. All your bonus bets. I mean, they're 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 giving out a thousand dollars in bonus bets over there at BetMGM. So, next question: Any chance T. Higgins becomes a bill? I think it's very low. I'll never say zero because they could just throw a crazy offer out there. But I would I hesitate to say zero for that reason. But I don't think it's, the probability is very high. Okay. No. What are the chances that Justin Fields? is the starting quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers in 2025? Uh, 30, 30% maybe? I think that, that's right. I think that's right. Think, someone Another podcast I was on, someone said 5%. I thought it was very low. No. I was thinking more 30%. So, you know, like minds, love it. I, I think that's uh, right. Can you just give the, the 
quick and dirty summary of why Justin Fields was able to be attained for what looked to be you know, a, a, a complete steal, some kind of fire sale where the, you know, basically it's like a trade in dynasty where all the 10 league mates are crying in the chat. Like this was a travesty. This was a ripoff. This was collusion. You know, that this, you know, someone got taken advantage of, you got to ask the rest of the league if they want to make any offers before you accept, this is a joke. Like that's what it seemed to me. But then I started thinking about all the different teams and what they would need to do to trade for him and what that would mean for their roster it started to make a little bit more sense, but I'm still not 100% clear on how the hell that happened. Well, I mean, they just sat on the asset too long. It's it's eerily reminiscent of what happened with Matt Ryan when he left Atlanta, when we were begging them you know, a year before, hey, if you're not going to pay him, trade him. And so the timeline on this is much shorter. But while teams were trying to fill their quarterback needs, you had to move them. And... I think that they were worried about playing their hand because they, like we said earlier, wanted to create the illusion that they were okay with keeping Justin and shopping the 101 just because they wanted to see what the offers would be, which any good franchise should do. That's what you should do. You want to know what every player and every pick you have is worth on the open market as often as you can. The problem was by the time they made the actual decision that they were going to move on from him, every team had filled their quarterback needs. Atlanta had signed Kirk Cousins. You know, we we had seen all the places that it made sense for him to go. Vegas had a quarterback, you know, and then yeah, it appeared for a second that Pittsburgh had their quarterback with Russell Wilson. There are all these moving parts around the league where now it seems pretty clear that the Vikings are going to move up and take a quarterback in the top five or ten. And all of these things happen, you know, simultaneously. And that's why Pittsburgh... Uh, excuse me, that's why Minnesota did the deal with Houston. You think to get a first round pick and that's more ammunition to move up even more? Yeah, they're 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 going into the top five and it's pretty clear that they want JJ McCarthy. Um it's you know, it may be Drake May or JJ McCarthy, one or the other, but you know, again, it's all speculation. This is this is lion season, man. This is keeping up with the Kardashians for men right now is what you're hearing out of NFL draft buzz. Everybody's lying to everybody. You have to really be sure about the information you're getting and kind of where it's coming from and why, because they're all jockeying for position. And, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the last second, the, uh, the Cardinals, Monty Austin for the, the thing that came out yesterday that, you know, all the draft aid trades loved seeing that behind the scenes, but that's really what it's like. You're on the clock with everybody all the time for those three days. And, you know, you need to be ready with what you think your assets are worth, whether they're players, whether they're picks, whether they're, you know, potential trades up or down, what you're willing to give up, what you're not willing to give up. And, you know, in the pressure of that moment, there are a lot of GMs that make decisions that they probably don't love simply because you're on adrenaline. You know, I mean, everybody, everyone that's listening to this at some point has made some decision just on pure adrenaline. And sometimes that was, that's what happens. And, you know, sometimes it's a great thing. Sometimes it's a terrible thing. It's even the best of the best GMs, the guys that we give the most credit to, the Howie Rosemans. Howie Roseman drafting wide receivers just sucks at it. And so he said, screw it. I'm not going to draft him. I'm going to pay you to take your guy in A.J. Brown. And then in terms of Devontae Smith, he was like, oh, I'm pretty sure this one's going to work. <laughs> that, that draft profile looks pretty strong. You want a Heisman? All right, we'll go, we'll go with that guy. Um, but even the best of the best have their missteps in the draft. And it's why when you see a draft like Houston's last year, you get so excited. Or Seattle's two years ago, you get so excited because it is so hard to hit on all of those early picks. And when you see returns like they're getting that immediately, that's the kind of stuff, you know, that, that keeps us excited and like, okay, yeah, this they built this team the proper way. They're investing in O-line. They found a quarterback. They have an edge rusher. There is a lockdown corner. There is a number one wide receiver. Before you go into interior middle linebacker or safety or you know <laughs> god forbid running back so they just they played it all kinds of wrong as yeah. as 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 good as chicago's been in you know, structuring their rebuild that they played the justin fields card all wrong they got it all wrong that's just what that's yeah. what happened he's worth more than that so if you're 
in a dynasty league and you're valuing Justin Fields based on what he commanded in trade, just know that it, it could have been very different six months earlier, three months earlier, a week earlier. Well, the question that I have, right, is if we're lo- if we're evaluating Russell Wilson, Justin Fields as dynasty assets, who's to say that Pittsburgh doesn't just throw? I, I think Russell will be the week one starter. I do. Yeah. And I think that they're going to give him a leash. How long that is, I don't know. But they're both one year rentals for them. They cost them functionally nothing. They rebuilt that room for two and a half million, something I mean, like that. That's the thing. Crazy. D- crazy. Let's not crazy. look past what. A, a a super savvy tactic that was to just yeah. say we'll we'll sign Russell Wilson and if no and and because all of the chairs in this in this quarterback musical chairs game have been occupied and there's no there's literally no trade partner for Chicago hell we'll raise our hand we already have Russell Wilson we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll dig back in now we've just doubled our odds. Yeah, so I, I think mean, they should just they should just do, give eight games to Wilson and eight games to Fields. I think that what they're going to do is they're going to give Russ the shot early in the season to see if he's still got something in the tank that he didn't show in Sean Payton's offense because that was just always a weird schematic fit. Sean Payton wants precise passers who do everything on time and on rhythm, kind of like a pseudo Kyle Shanahan, and it's uh, it's drastically different when you have a guy that wants max protect and run play action and hold the ball for four and a half seconds and fire shots deep down the field. That's not what Sean Payton does. That's a weird marriage to begin with. Um, I think that, you know, his, him sucking last year was greatly overstated, but I just don't think he's the same player anymore. And if you have someone that's young enough, right? Fields is young enough that, you might be able to extract something out of him that Chicago just couldn't that I think if Russ doesn't show he's still capable of being a QB one in this league at a relatively mid to elite level, I think they're going to pull the plug at some point, probably week 10, week 11 and let Justin Fields show them what he can do. Of course, because, because at some point, you know, you can see what you see in practice, but you've got to see what they look like when live bullets are flying. And, you know, they're not planning on contending for a Super Bowl this year. They're just, they're not. And, you know, if they contend, it's going to be basically, you know, because Fields or Wilson hit big and they're going to have their answer at quarterback for another year or two with one of them. But, you know, the, the interesting thing about the way that Omar Khan built this QB room is it was Kenny Pickett and then he shipped him out. And for basically a cheaper price. He acquired Justin Fields, who I think, even if you think that he's not quite figured out the quarterback part of it is significantly more talented than Kenny Pickett is by a wide margin Yeah, and Russell Wilson. And so, I mean, if you're going to take, we talked about this last year with Anthony Richardson, if you're going to take lottery ticket shots, if you're going to miss quote unquote on quarterback, Missing on a 99th percentile athlete in Anthony Richardson isn't the worst idea. No. Missing on missing on a Justin Fields who athletically profiles as a smaller Cam Newton almost was a more accurate passer in college than Cam was. And you, you know, in Russell Wilson, who has shown Hall of Fame years in this league, if that's what you're gonna miss on, then I'm perfectly okay with you missing on that. That's that's not a you know, that's not a swing and miss on some low ceiling quarterback that, you know, is just gonna drag you to seven or eight wins and keep you running through the mud. This is either gonna go pretty well or rather poorly. And either way, it's gonna work out for Pittsburgh. That's a great, yeah, it's a great move. What do you think Pittsburgh's gonna do with pick twenty? It's a fun, fun, fun spot. Oof. I would love to see them. It, I would love to see them trade out of it in all honesty and kind of rebuild some of the stuff that they're, you know, rebuild some of their roster as a whole. Um, because I mean, everybody's getting older that's that's playing there. You've got TJ Watt in the prime of his career, Micah Fitzpatrick, obviously. Um, but you know, as far as depth goes, especially playing in that division, when you're playing Cincinnati twice a year, Baltimore twice a year, Cleveland twice a year, uh, you just need bodies. So for me, it'd be interior O-line, interior D-line. Um, 
And and basically, I know they drafted Keanu Benton last year. I know that they've got TJ Watt. I would continue to invest in interior O line and give whatever quarterback that you've got out there a shot at success. Um, you know, if you feel strongly about a tackle, I wouldn't be upset about that at all. If you want to grab and, you know, if you want to basically bookend Watt with another edge rusher, you could also do that. Well, um, I mean, JC Latham is 360 pounds. He, big boy. Right. And that he, he, that's, that's that area. That's what we're talking about. And you've mm-hmm. got, uh, you know, maybe, uh, Jerzon Newton drops to them. Uh, Johnny maybe, Newton's a freak. Yeah. You've got Braylon Trice. You've got a lot of, you've got, you get some nice options there. There's a lot of good cornerbacks in that area too. Yeah, they could also so, absolutely go DB. I mean, yeah. there's they, they could they could definitely go DB. There's going to be a lot of a lot of great options. Anytime you have a, anytime you can get a guy named Kool Aid, um, I'm, I'm I'm a fan, <laughs> right? So there's a, a lot of great options. But yeah, pro, pro, they're going either offensive line or defense. That's what Pittsburgh does, and that's uh, that's a perfectly uh, acceptable move there. Um, but yeah, the draft is going to be fun. The draft is going to be interesting. We're going to be there. We're going to be broadcasting live uh, all the picks at the NFL draft. Uh, in the meantime, we're launching our rookie guide, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, that's coming very soon. That's going to be, uh, I think, uh, a uh, uh, revolution in you know rookie analysis. You know, whatever you've seen from us in the in the past. It's all the, it's it's all those guys, you know, providing the draft analysis like Matty Kiwum and Theo Greminger. But now we're adding more uh, Dan Williamson, Theo Greminger, more fantasy impact, more fantasy. So it, it, we talk about real football and fantasy football, and, and you combine that into one rookie guide. It, it it doesn't get any better. When you look at Tennessee, Tony Pollard, Calvin Ridley. It looks like they are doing everything they can to support Will Levis and create a wide open offense. Do you like what they're doing? I mean, I think if if you believe as clearly, you know, Tennessee believed in Levis, and there were reasons to believe in Levis last year. There's there's a lot of talent there. Um, I think it needs a lot of refinement relative to what we see at the NFL level. But given what they had and what they gave him last year, it's night and day. I mean, Calvin Ridley is leaps and bounds better than than you know what they had hoped to have there. Did they overpay for him? I think so. Um, but crazy contract, bad contract. Yeah. And then bad, you know, bad, but, bad. There's so many Lenny, better deals you can get on similar players. He's not like a size speed specimen. He's he's just not. He's not like a an, an, an elite. A target earner. He's just, he's very, he's just a very good, solid player, well now into the back half of his career. So it wasn't overpay, but generally I like it when teams are, are, are signaling that, hey, we're going to go three and four wide receivers. We're going satellite backs. We're going to, we're going to pass the football. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, if, if that's the goal, if that's the the direction they want to go, because it's a drastic change from what Mike Vrabel's Tennessee Titans look like, you know, with Derrick Henry running 35 times a game. Yeah, there, there's if it's going to look a lot different, it's not the Titans that we're used to by any means. God, when they wow. on the, in the red zone channel, when they would go to the, the Tennessee game, it's always like, oh, God, OK, here's Derrick Henry. <laughs> oh, my God, please. No, Um, I mean, you know. And, you know, you want to talk about a perfect fit, Derrick Henry in a Baltimore Ravens uniform? I, about I, time. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a dream fit. That's going to be so much fun with him and Lamar. Oh, man. They um, made Gus Edwards a thing. Yeah, they, we're going to see the – that. this is like the, the, the ultimate sort of manifestation of the Alfred Morris corollary <laughs> where the mobile quarterback freezes linebackers, creates wider running lanes, and uh, who better to exploit them than Derrick Henry? What is John Harbaugh going to do in Los Angeles? What the hell is this wily guy going to do? What you mean Jim is, Harbaugh? <laughs> what, is, what is Jim Harbaugh? Did I say John Harbaugh? Because we were just yeah. talking about the Ravens. Uh, excuse me. I got my – that, 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 that was a major blunder on the show right there. 
What is Jim Harbaugh going to do in Los Angeles? I think he's going to establish things that they've desperately needed for a long time, which basically is there is going to be an identity to buy into. And we just talked about the Titans. Whether you loved Mike Frabel or not, whether you loved you know what the Titans looked like, what the Ravens looked like, what the Steelers looked like, they have identities. They're, they're fundamentally sound teams that run the ball well, that throw when they have to, and that, you know, when they have quarterback talent like a Lamar Jackson, like a Justin Herbert, succeed. And you're seeing all of it manifest itself in real time, right? The first thing that he's going to do is build a wall in front of Justin Herbert on the O-line. And then they're going to run the ball probably a lot. And what they're going to do is give Justin Herbert the ability over time to they're not show. Gonna, wait, they're not going to trade Justin Herbert and, and then and try to trade up for, and, and, and then draft uh, J.J. McCarthy? No. No. Justin Herbert is a very special quarterback that you do not trade <laughs> under most circumstances. so And I think they know that. I mean, you just know, because I, I, a guy coached a guy and liked a guy doesn't mean he's going to you know move mountains and earth to get that guy and also mm-hmm. going to look a... I mean, the one thing that you would need to coax a guy like Jim Harbaugh out of college football is a young franchise quarterback. So and, the, the whole reason he's there is Justin Herbert. So the idea that they're going with McCarthy is uh, that's, that's so weird. Yeah. Uh, what they end up doing though is going to be interesting. Well, I mean, they've, they've moved off of all their big money receivers. They've moved off of their running back. They've, you know, it, it's basically reset and we're going to rebuild this thing in the image of Harbaugh and with Justin Herbert as our franchise piece. And, you know, for all of the discussion about Jim Harbaugh, the coach, and, you know, he's a bit of a quirky guy. There's, you know, um, you can say whatever you want about the guy. He's won everywhere he's gone. NFL level, college level, both stops. I mean, you know, it, it's really easy to forget that, you know, once upon a time, Alex Smith was the quarterback in San Francisco and his career was dead. He was a failed project. It was a number one overall pick that no one was ever going to write home about. And Jim Harbaugh came there and basically saved his career. And then Colin Kaepernick came in and had an electric run to the Super Bowl. And then a bunch of stuff happened between him and a GM where that guy is now in Jacksonville. We're not the biggest fans of him. And, you know, when when you look at kind of how they're going to build this thing, they have identities. The Harbaugh's do things in a very certain way. Jesse Minter, the defensive coordinator from Michigan, brilliant, 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 brilliant mind. Um, every, every, you know, version of the defensive coordinators at Michigan that they cycled through post Don Brown in 2018, 2019, I think, you know, all of the guys that came through Baltimore and then came through Michigan have found success elsewhere. Mike McDonald found success elsewhere. Jesse, Michael Minter, McDonald, Michael McDonald, <laughs> Mikey Mack, as some may call him. Um, uh, but you know, you, you look at all of these guys and what they found is, there are certain pieces of an organization that you have to have. And, you know, this is going into a tangent for a little bit because I'm a Buckeye and we keep close tabs on all things Michigan. There's a guy that they took with that, that Jim Harbaugh took with him and Michigan fans were very upset about it. And they should be because he was the life beat, the heartbeat of that program. His name is Ben Herbert. He was the strength and conditioning coach at Michigan. And you look at what these guys came in as, as three and four star recruits. And they came out, and they won a national mm. championship without a bunch of five-star recruits all over the place. That's really difficult to do. That, that it's a testament to what they built there over and that, years. That's and all. Years that, and you're, you're attributing that to Michael McDonald. I'm attributing that to Ben Herbert. I'm attributing that to a lot of the coaches that that Jim stole from his from his brother John because he realized that in order to stop all these high flying college offenses, that he was going to have to adopt what the Ravens had been running to slow down all these lethal passing attacks in the NFL. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where you start to see now college teams are trying to pry NFL defensive coordinators away. And, and you know, NFL, NFL teams are doing the same opposite. You know, they swap pieces all the time now. Um, but 
there's a lot to like about what Jim Harbaugh can bring to the Chargers in terms of stability. I like it. You, I like it. You know, you know that he has won everywhere he's gone. You know that his method for doing things works, even if it's a little abrasive. And sometimes when you're the Chargers, when you are all this talent on paper that gets really close to achieving potential and has hor- horrific injuries every year or roster falls apart for some reason or, you know, player X busts, right? Jim Harbaugh's culture will keep that team and that front office and that ownership group aligned because he will tell them, this is what I foresee us doing. And I think that the proof is in, it took him a while to turn Stanford around. It took him a while to turn San Francisco around. It took him a while to turn Michigan around. And that's not to say that they didn't, you know, they didn't get better immediately, but to get to the level that they want to go, the Chargers are further away in a conference that has so many top quarterbacks surrounded by so many longtime GMs that have figured out years and years and years of stacking the right pieces together that their roster is just expensive. Khalil Mack, expensive. Joey Bo, looking at last year, Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa, ridiculously expensive. You have Mike Williams, outrageously expensive. Keenan Allen, expensive. Austin Eckler, top of the market running back contract. When you look at all of these things, they're just, they were too old in places that you need youth and depth, and they just didn't have it. They, the roster had to be rebuilt in the image of someone else. And, you know, I think Jim Harbaugh is one of those guys where you can adopt the identity of the team with him as opposed to through Justin Herbert. And we're going to throw the ball 45, 50 times a game. I mean, the, They've they're tearing it down, man. They've got a long way to go, or as Michael yeah. McDonald would say, "Such a long way to go." <laughs> I was still waiting. I was waiting for ten minutes to <laughs> say that. Oh my god! So my my take on, on Jim Harbaugh is this is the quintessential person who benefits from age. He was just too much for too many people. Right. He was just he alienated people. He was too much, man. And the way he would drink the milk. I mean, it was just too much. It was over the top. Right. And this is the type of guy that does really well in his 60s, because then he kind of like mellows a little bit. If you can just get you take Jim Harbaugh and turn him from 10 to nine. That's that. Now you get all the benefit without the cost. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're going to see what happens. I, I'm, I'm with you. I think that we're in the minority. I think that there's a lot of skepticism because there's been so many college coaches fail. Right. But just because Cliff Kingsbury couldn't make it work and oh Nick God. Saban couldn't make it work. And a lot of guys can't make Almost nobody can make it work. Chip Kelly couldn't make it work. Who was I've already forgotten his name. I feel bad. This is this is embarrassing. Who was the the Baylor coach that went to Carolina? Oh, uh, Matt Rule. Matt Rule. Matt Rule couldn't make it work. There's been a lot, right? It's it's very steep. This might be the guy. He has his brother. He can always ask his brother what to do. Like he has NFL experience. He's done it already with San Francisco. If there was one college guy that you could see making it work, it would be Jim Harbaugh. And I'm excited. I'm excited to see and my my wish, and this is going to be asking way too much. My wish is that he kind of limits his uh, command and control of the NFL draft. But Let's because see. that never works. Yeah, when the tough. coach exerts maximum control over the NFL draft, that is always bad. Big mistake. I mean, you'd have to go back to Jimmy Johnson to find someone who actually, you know, you had a, a, a heavy hand in the NFL draft and it actually worked out. And, you know, there's, there's so much that you have to get right as an NFL head coach. And as a general manager, your coordinator hires are obviously super important. Your position coach hires, you know, the, the guys that are in those meetings every day, kind of trying to establish a culture and an identity. We saw it in Philly with when Nick Sirianni was hired and we saw what Shane Steichen and Jonathan Gannon were as coaches. They got hired as head coaches, you know, shortly thereafter, simply because of what they built together in that one year in, in Philly. And it, it's really hard for all of those things to align. We talked about Houston 
ad nauseum earlier, getting everything to align. And sometimes you need guys that have been failed head coaches, failed coordinators to come back in and, and kind of reestablish themselves as something else. Um, we see this all the time with, you know, position coaches that become coordinators, that become head coaches, then they go back to being coordinators, they go be, back to being position coaches, and they're phenomenal at what they used to do, as opposed to when you elevate them a level, they're not quite there. And we talk about that a lot when it comes from coordinator to head coach, and then back to coordinator. We don't talk about it as much when we talk about, you know, you have an offensive line coach like Bill Callahan that goes to a coordinator, goes to a head coach, goes to a Super Bowl with the Raiders, and then, you know, eventually trickles back down and is one of the better off offensive line coaches in the league. You know, it's um it's uh it's a big it's a big jump to make because if you've never called plays before, asking someone to call plays that's never done that is a it's a steep climb. <laughs> um, no, but but and then, uh, by the same token, there's been plenty of coordinators that get elevated via the Peter principle to head coach. And they flop as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let coordinators coordinate and let leaders lead. Mm -hmm. And say what you want about Jim Harbaugh. This guy's a leader. Yeah. But, but when you come to John Harbaugh, too, when you look at him, he was a special teams coach. From the pod father to you, I deeply appreciate you tuning in. And many ask, what can I do? What can I do to help support the host, the research they do, the production costs? Go to playerprofile.com, Dynasty Deluxe, World Famous Draft Kit, Rankings, DFS Dominator, and of course, Data Analysis. Subscribe to any one of those, and you support all of us and take Player Profiler to the moon.